Well, thanks for uh, praying for next week, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I don't get to preach as often as I used to, uh, which is not a bad thing. But there are times when I really get kind of hungry to preach again. This is one of those times, and the timing is just perfect, and I'm working hard on uh, getting sermons ready that I uh, hope will be beneficial. They're sure helping me. I'm hoping they'll help everybody else in the process. Well, let's, let's kind of wrap up the I Am sayings today. The final one we started on last week, I Am the True Vine. Uh, that passage in John 15 is a crucial passage of Scripture for our understanding of the relationship that we have with the Father and with the Son. Uh, the... Uh, the metaphors or allegories, this really is more a metaphor, uh, an allegory than a metaphor because he carries it so far out in so many different ways. So it's a fascinating passage of scripture. We were dealing with it some last week, as you recall. Let me, let me go back and look at a couple of things. First, I'm the true vine, understanding that the setting in which Jesus is, Jesus is speaking is uh, the Passover. They are preparing to receive the elements of, of that very important feast. Now, in the Gospel of John, we don't have this, the account, the descriptive account of what was done, the way we have it in Matthew and Luke, where he breaks the bread and he gives them the cup. But one thing we do know about it, if you've ever been to one of uh, uh, Roger Hahn's uh, Seder meals, there are very specific steps within that meal that are taken. And among the very specific steps is the step of the cup. And you may remember in, um, I think, believe it's the Gospel of Luke, where uh, uh, the, the reference is made to after supper taking the cup. Some people call it the cup of Jeremiah, the prophetic cup, and whatever. You know, there are a lot of things that... Uh, we have a lot of conjecture about, not a whole lot of certainty about. But one of the things we do know is one of the references throughout the evening would have brought to mind the figure of Israel as the vine of God. There was a purpose for raising up Israel. The purpose was not just for the existence of the people of Israel. They were always intended to be a means by which God would be communicating into this broken world his care and concern for all of humanity. But do you realize how easy it is for us to turn good things in on ourselves? To begin to assume that uh, what is actually penultimate meaning it's on the way toward the ultimate, becomes ultimate. That Israel begins to exist for the sake of Israel and Israel alone. That's why Jesus would say, I am the true vine. Uh, I love the way N.T. Wright puts it. He said, Jesus, when he say, is saying these things, is saying, I am the personification of Israel. I am Israel in person, not taking the place so much as fulfilling all that Israel was intended to become. And so when he says, I am the true vine, there is specific reference here to what it means for him to be that physical representation of all that Israel was intended to become. Not always easy for us to follow that kind of thinking. Not always easy for us to take on the implications of that. You, you may remember that the Jews, the uh, Pharisees, the teachers of the law, those who were confronting Jesus over and over again, kept, kept dealing with the fact that he was not getting it right. That he wasn't for, uh, performing. He wasn't 
filling out. He wasn't living the law the way that the law was intended to be lived in their minds. And so it was performance that mattered to them. Uh, one of my favorite books is a book by Dallas Willard entitled The Renovation of the Heart. It's a book about spiritual formation, about being formed into the very image of Christ. And he makes this very significant point early in the book that the renovation of the heart is the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, I, I grew up in the holiness tradition and I love it to the core of my being. Because I think there's some depths of insight that are found in this whole concept of the capacity we have to be utterly transformed formed by the renewing of our minds. But I also grew up in an era in a part of the country where holiness was measured by performance <coughs> and appearance. Anybody else ever yeah. live with that? Oh, yeah. What are your memories of that? You never quite get it. Yeah. Quite reach that pinnacle. Yeah. You were always inadequate. Mm -hmm. I remember as a teenager, it was an era when the proper length of men's haircuts was an issue. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I remember it well. Long hair equals sin. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. She's in trouble then, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Elmo? Over the years, I've uh, thought a lot about that, and one of the thoughts that reoccurs for me is what possibly did the early leaders of the Church of Nazareth get right and they tend to think that they were marginal? Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's truth to being like Christ. Yeah. And yeah. Well, not the length of our hair, but the truth is there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I think part of the truth is that being Christ-like always comes down to specifics. It's not, it's not a vague general idea. Yeah. It has to take particular form in our lives. But then the challenge is, well, what are the, what are the proper specifics? Where does yeah. it matter and where yeah. does it matter? You know, we have a manual in the Church of the Nazarene. Anybody ever seen the manual? <laughs> I had a wonderful experience just recently with a new family to our church who, who've been attending here, uh, believers for many years, but just looking for something, to, this is his term, something deeper. And so was fascinated by coming to the Church of the Nazarene and here's talking about the doctrine of entire sanctification, the deeper life, that God could utterly rearrange our lives. And uh, he was here for some months before uh, he discovered that there was a manual of the Church of the Nazarene. And it scared the life out of him. He said, is this like the Book of Mormon? And I began to try to say to him, oh, no, 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 no. Because by this time he'd picked one up and he'd begun to read. And some of the things you read were unsettling to him quite a bit. And I had to say to him what I had to say to, to uh, congregations and especially to membership classes for 28 years as a pastor. Our descriptions in the manual are never intended to be the means by which we become Christian or that we manifest Christianity. They were never intended to be the heart. They were always intended to somehow give us some means by which we could define some parameters. But we were always supposed to be pushed back to this until the heart is changed. 
Nothing else will really change until the heart is changed. One of the most conservative early holiness writers uh, that I've read in, in, a, in an early uh, commentary on the Gospel of Matthew was, was writing about uh, the whole issue of divorce. And this was written, oh, around the 19, early 1920s, maybe late teens, early 20s, uh, written to an era where the definitions as it related to guidelines for conduct and the length of hymns and the length of hair and this kind of thing were very important to us. And, and, and they were important and had uh, some valid reasons for being important. But in that book, in dealing with the whole issue of divorce, I was struck by a phrase that he used where he came to the conclusion that Jesus said, when Jesus said, when the Pharisees had asked, uh, didn't Moses give us the right to divorce? And Jesus is responding and saying, well, yeah, he did because of the hardness of your hearts. And then this, this very conservative, we would call him today very legalistic author, made this statement. A certificate of divorce, a certificate of divorce? Would we be tolerant of a certificate of divorce? Oh, better, he said, to live within the dispensation of Moses for a time for corrective than to live under the dispensation of Satan. And then he went on to say, our hearts are the issue. Sometimes we build walls to keep us from wandering too far until we get to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue, he said, is holy love. It, it, we just need to go back and remember that. That it is this transformation of the heart that Jesus is talking about here. I'm the true vine, the true, the representation of all that Israel is intended to be. I am the vine and my father is the vine grower. And he, we, we go on, we need to get into this a bit. So um, the relationship between the vine grower, the one who cares for the vine, and the vine, we need to look at for a few moments. When Jesus said, uh, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, to Philip. When Jesus said, everything I say, I say because of what the Father has sent me to say. I don't say anything on my own. I only say what the Father has given me to say. All of those references that seem in some ways self-deprecating must be read within the context of our understanding of the Trinity. Because if we're not careful, we fall into a, an error, a doctrinal error, some, call, some could call it heresy, of what is called subordinationism, where we sort of break down the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that somehow the, the Son is somewhat subordinate to the Father. The one thing we have to remember is this. God is one, in essence one, in persons three, none of them, no one of them is subservient to the other. All of them live in this choreosis, this, that we, the, the, the term that is used, this divine dance that is always going on, that the Father, and the Son are working together to accomplish the purposes of God for the recreation of the world. This is not 
Jesus having to do what the Father said you better do. This is Jesus doing what God does. Put your hand up, devil. Could the vine or any vine exist without the vine grower or prior to the vine grower? In our understanding of, you know, if, if you're trying to take this too far in here, we, yeah. we, we give uh, infinite yeah. <laughs> meaning to finite efforts. We can't. But the vine grower is behind it all. And that is the Father. And that is the, well, that is God. Pardon? That is God. It says the Father right there. Yeah, it does. And he said, I'm the vine. The right. vine grower is Father. But that doesn't mean a subordination. Well, in some people minds it suggests that there might be. Yeah, it does. That's, that's, that's how we get to subordination. The vine grower is not the vine. The vine grower is not the vine in this particular image. But and what we have... couldn't exist without the vine grower. And it preceded the vine. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems so simple that we can't believe it. Yeah. Another another angle on this is um, if you think of the vine grower, I guess we're thinking in terms of somebody like who is farming, yeah, right, yeah. vineyards. Yeah. Um, actually, vines and stuff were around before farmer. They predate the farmer. Yeah. And 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 the the creator of vines did the work before vine growers got into the business. And that creator is, as John mm -hmm. reminds us, for example, mm -hmm. was Jesus. I mean, Jesus was part of Through so him all things were created. Yeah, so the whole Godhead yeah. was involved in the creation. Yeah. So this, this is a more particular, I think a little more particular analogy, yeah. kind of parable yeah. that yeah. is meant to make certain points, but again, doesn't explain everything. No metaphor, no analogy is ever intended to be final. Right. You know, they're, they're means why, to it. Why do we call it a metaphor when Jesus said, the Father is greater than I am? Why do we call that? Well, that's not metaphorical. It is? But uh, that, I, I don't think that's metaphorical. I think he's just expressing out of the reality that he is trying to give. When he says that he greater, has come. Doesn't that suggest subordination? Depends on how you read it. <laughs> And, I, you know, the difficulty for all of us, and this is one of those places, the difficulty for all of us is reading any scripture in isolation. All scripture must be an interpretation of scripture. And um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of fun with uh, a, a lot of the debate that goes on on social media between various theological perspectives. And I love hearing people come to the place where they are absolutely certain they have it finally figured out. And everybody else who doesn't believe it that way is wrong. Isn't that exactly what Constantine demanded of the Council of Nicaea? The church struggled with this issue in some degree of humility. And Constantine said, you guys settle this, and I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> yeah. Constantine. And Constantine is dead. <laughs> we buy his certainty that at no time was the sun existing. Prior, or, well, the, no, there's no time the sun never existed. But yeah. He says, I am the yeah. firstborn of the Father. Yeah. The very term Father, Son, suggested that the Father preceded the Son. And you take the whole scripture and not just. Orthodoxy, and I think you can struggle the same things to accept orthodoxy. Well, I, and I think we all must continue to struggle with it. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I think it's part of the, the wrestling we always will be doing. Yes. The, I think Wesley is very helpful uh, as we wrestle in his um, assistance for helping people understand relational. Mm -hmm. theology when it comes to the Trinity right. Um, right. rather than hierarchical authoritative 
Mm -hmm. That it's a relationship of love. Uh, love and, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, for lack of a better term, submission. Yeah. One to another. And submission one to another, I think, is part of the key to it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. You know, all of those, that very beginning of the Gospel of John refers us back again to the fact that this is a conundrum we will always live with in this side of glory. And um, I'm not content to feel like we've got it all figured out. I'm in fact, uh, one of the staff members here at Kansas City First Church said to me while I was pastor here, I think the thing that bothers me most about you is that you have a high degree of toleration for ambiguity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I just said it guilty as charged. I'm not able to ever come to a place where I'm fixed in such a way that scripture can't nudge me <coughs> here and there in places where I need to be nudged. Do we need to be nudged? Do you need to be nudged? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that would help. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Helen Temple testifying to that fact in her later years in life. Yes. About yes. the Lord still speaking clearly to her. Yeah. After her walk with him for yeah. many years. A, a quick story when I became pastor, um, Albert Harper, uh, Helen Temple, two or three others of that generation were still on the board. I mean, they were on the board. In some ways, those were the most liberal thinkers we had because they were not ever so categorically fixed that they couldn't hear the spirit nudging and changing. And I don't know, not many people know the story of our moving to three different worship uh, services. Very few people remember that one of the major influences in that was Albert Harper, who said, if we must do it one way or the other, maybe we've missed the point of the New Testament. I will never forget that moment. I just, I, I wanted to say to him, how old are you? But and his, also in that process, we remember that um, the Lessons and Helen Temple mm -hmm. were in that contemporary service. In the contemporary service, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that I loved Helen being in there so much was she went to the contemporary service and she was telling how some of the older generation were a bit critical of her for going to that service. And she said, well, the thing I remember is it brought me back to my little home church where we had an upright piano and we knew it was a great service when that particular pianist would play the piano and the hymn book would bounce off the top of the little piano. <laughs> she I loved it. So, uh, well, back, back to this, this whole thing. Look at verse 4. You've been cleansed by the word I've spoken to you, verse 3. Verse 4, abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Two or three things here that we need to get into. Oh, my word. Can't believe we've got this little bit of time left. Abide in me. NIV says remain in me. Other translations have other words. Abide, remain. Um, this, the sense of that is not right now abiding. It's abiding. It's remaining in. It's longitudinal. It, it has to do with the kind of, of abiding that is patient. I, I love Alan Pryder's book, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. And, uh, the point that he makes is that the early church in the first 200 years of the church was just beginning to form the canon. They didn't have the Roman 
empire on its side, on their side. They didn't rail against the leadership because it wasn't giving them the freedom to be what they needed to be. I sometimes laugh when I hear people talk about losing our religious freedoms. Folks, nobody can take away your ability to worship God wherever you are. I've seen that around the world in places that just stun me. When we talk about repression and oppression, and yet in some of those places I've been where repression and oppression is so intense, the freedom of worship is beyond description because they just worship. And, and here, part of the concern that I think we have to deal with is this. We get so preoccupied with immediate results. Your friend, Kathy, the patience of cultivating that relationship to a point, staying in the relationship to a point that the implication of your faith and testimony has come to this place. They are in need and where did they turn? The early New Testament church lived what, they, uh, what uh, Kreider calls the habitus that was the fulfilling of the Sermon on the Mount. They didn't have the letters of Paul. They were being shaped and formed as scripture. But what they did have were the teachings of Jesus. And the teaching that was primary and foremost was the Sermon on the Mount. They actually believed you could live the Sermon on the mount. Now, here. I heard a very well known radio preacher several years ago now. Well known, very well known, widely acclaimed, and he was a tremendous communicator. Preach on the Beatitudes. Wonderful insight powerful message. At the conclusion of the message he said, please understand that what I'm describing for you is life as it will be in glory, not as it is now. This isn't possible in this life. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'd like for him to read Alan Kreider's book. The thing says Kreider, that conquered the Roman Empire was the willingness of the Christian to live Christ-like, even if it cost them everything. The trades people who were Christians became so trustworthy that their businesses prospered not by taking advantage of people in, un, uh, in dishonest weights in measuring, but in that they were so honest that even if it cost them, they would keep their word. And the result was people began to trust them and come back to them for their trades. They were willing, if it took it, to turn the other cheek and be abused and bruised. They were willing, if necessary, to die for the faith. And we keep demanding that the government protect us and give us permission to be Christian. No. Something's wrong with that picture. Yes. We follow Christ. Absolutely. Period. And Christ says, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You can ask whatever you will. Now that's where we really get excited. Well then, <laughs> I'd like a pink Cadillac. Or I'd like perfect health. Or I'd like to avoid, you know, look, Lord, here comes the hurricane. Blow it east of here so that we are not damaged. <laughs> what kind of Christianity can it be that says, thank God that he sent the storm someplace else so that we were not hurt? No, 
we need to look at what happens here for those branches that are abiding in the vine and you see the account of what the gardener does, the vine owner, the, the uh, farmer comes with pruning hook in hand and the branches that are bearing no fruit are just simply laid aside, they wither, they die, they're burned. The, the branches that are bearing fruit are being trimmed clean. Oh my word. I, I, there are times when that's difficult for me. When I see people going through great trauma. And the temptation we have is to say, well, it was just the will of God. Let's be careful that we don't impugn the reputation of God by attributing motives to him that are not true to the character of Jesus. Let me go back and say it again. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. God will always be like Jesus. The trimming clean, there are times when uh, there's not a natural disaster, but the Lord has sure cleaned my clockworks. When the Lord is disciplined, the Lord is challenged, the Lord is probed, the Lord is nudged, sometimes the Lord has shoved. Do bad things happen to good people? Of course they do. That doesn't necessarily mean that God intended that to be a means by which you are going to be cleaned. What it may mean is that it gives you the opportunity to allow that to be an experience that creates greater reliance on Christ. We don't always get this right. Just looking here in this passage of scripture that the word remain or abide yeah. as near as I counted are 11, 11 times it says mm -hmm. it in those whatever 17 verses Yeah, must be some significance to that <laughs> yeah. uh, but you're talking about us nudging, being nudged or growing or learning uh, what I take from that is to say hey he says, hang in there mm -hmm. and uh, keep following me, keep on growing, mm -hmm. get pruned every now and again, but stay with it, mm -hmm. keep on abiding and trusting in me, mm -hmm. no matter what comes our way. Yeah. No matter what comes. Yeah. Yeah. I have one short point that's been rattling my head. Uh, the difference between abide in and abide with is yes. significant to me. Yes. It's abide in, not with. Right, right. It's an Absolutely. entirely different. Yeah, it is a relational thing. Yeah, it's not mind. mutual. Yeah, right. Yeah, if my words abide in you, abide in me, my words abide in you. What we're talking about here is a deeply intentional relational dynamic by which our heart has been transformed by his presence. Living like Christ was never promised to be easy. But it was always promised that he would be with us. I love the story of the death of John Wesley. Uh, it, it is told that um, as he was dying, he said, I, the chief of sinners, am, but Jesus died for me. And then among the last things he said was, best of all, God is with us. I love that, but I love it in part because there were three occasions in which John Wesley was so close to death that he thought he was dying. And he said the same thing all three. because he was at rest in him, abiding in him. Well, it's 
time to go. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that knowing you doesn't mean that we completely comprehend all there is about you. In fact, the likelihood is very strong, Lord, we will never get that done. But may we so live before you that whether we understand you or not, we are at rest in you. We sometimes dread the pruning hook. But Lord, when the pruning does occur, may the fruit be sweet. And may all that you desire to fulfill in us and through us be done as we walk patiently and lovingly with you and with others, reflecting the very presence and love of Christ to those around us. We pray all of this in the strong and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks. I've, I've enjoyed sharing the uh, I am sayings with you. There's a missing I am. If you read the book, the, the, the afterword is about the missing I am, yes. uh, which I love to think about because there's never, ever going to be enough said about Jesus to get it all in. But what might he have meant for him to have said, I am the water of life? How many times he spoke of water and yet never uses that as one of the I am, points of focus for the I am. Fascinating to me if we think about it. But the Spirit becomes the source of water for us. Well, thanks. That's